folks. It is good to be down here. I thought it was going to be warmer coming south, and it is not any warmer down here whatsoever. I want to say good morning to the Bee Cave campus and the Southwest campus. I am so excited about being with you guys this morning down here in Dripping. Uh, so many prayers have gone into, continue to go into you guys. God's doing a work among you. We hear about this work at the Bee Cave and Southwest campus. God is changing lives, and, and you guys are being used in miraculous ways. So I want to encourage you to continue in the faith. Continue being faithful down here. Continue loving Jesus, and God's going to continue to transform this community. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians. We're continuing our series this morning. This incredible book, we talked about having a secure salvation. We talked about the fact that we are qualified to inherit. We, we, we talked about we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We're being delivered. We talked about we have redemption of sins. We have forgiveness of sins. We talked about that all creation, Jesus was the agent of all creation, and he is also all creation is coming back to him and through him and for him to glorify him. He is the preeminent one. We talked about these incredible truths, and today what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in verse 19. I'm going to ask you guys to stand as we read the text this morning. Colossians 1, I'm going to start in verse 19, and we'll go through 23. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Father, as we walk into this text, this amazing text about our beautiful reconciliation this morning, I pray that you would bring the wisdom from the scriptures, the divineness from the scriptures, and may you transform our hearts because of it. Father, we came here today wanting to hear from you, and I pray that you would speak to us and through us from your word. I pray, Father, we leave here today, we'd be different because your word transforms and renews and it encourages. I pray for those who came here today that are hurting, that they would feel your encouragement and your presence. I pray for those who came here with some pride that thinking I'm pretty good on my own, that you would break us and you would build us back up into your image. It's in the glorious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The scriptures are clear on a lot of things. One of the things the scriptures are clear on is that you and I will stand one day in judgment. And the question I have this morning is, who's going to stand with you? It's not going to be your pastor. It's not going to be even your spouse or your best friend or your Bible study leader. Who is going to be standing with you at the judgment? That there is only one mediator the Bible talks about that is worthy and capable of standing with us. That Jesus is our mediator. That he is completely sufficient as that mediator. You know, the Gnostics, we've been talking about the Gnostics in Colossians. The Gnostics in this town of Colossae, their teaching was that Jesus is great. He's a great teacher. He's, he's, he's a holy man. But he is not enough. That you've got to add to him. And so these Gnostic teachers, they, they taught, as does religion today, that you have to have Jesus plus something. That you've got to trust in Jesus, but you also got to work hard. And a lot of us, myself included, grew up in church. We grew up with this religious view of Christ that is, I love Jesus, I respect Jesus, I trust in Jesus, but I've got to maintain this Christian walk. I've got to maintain this faith. I've got to do this stuff so that I'm approved, so that when I stand before God, hopefully the good will outweigh the bad. And then when you look at Christianity, that, that's not what Christianity says. Christianity says when you stand there, Jesus will be standing beside you. And the fact that Jesus is standing beside you means that you will go to heaven because he alone is worthy and his righteousness alone is enough. Jesus plus what? Nothing. And so a lot of us, again, try to add to that. So, so how can we not fall into this religious sense of things even today? Like I'll give you the example of where you can see religion in your life. Something bad happens in our life. And the first thought is, what did I do wrong that God is doing this to me? 
And what can I do or what must I do so that God will take this bad thing out of my life? Folks, that is the seedbed of religion. Because the thought is, is that what I have in my life is based on what I'm not doing if it's bad. What I have in my life, if it's good, is based on what I am doing. So everything that comes in my life is based on my own conduct and my own behavior. I had someone tell me the other day that he had been healed from cancer, and I rejoiced. And then he says, I believe if you have enough faith, God will heal you from cancer. And I said, okay, here's a problem with that philosophy. Is it possible that God wants to take someone home through the means of cancer and they may be a very, very faithful, God-fearing person? Because when you start thinking that if you can pray it away out of your own conduct, then Jesus Christ, why would he have died on the cross? Because he was the most holy. Why did the disciples get killed for their faith? A horrible ending to life because they were the most holy. We see Jesus, a man of sufferings, a man of struggle, and he was the most holy. When I look at godly people in the Bible, when I look at godly people in the church, they have gone through some of the darkest, most horrific things. Could it be that God chooses certain people to do some of his best work and a lot of times it comes through some tough times? That God does his greatest work when you have nothing else but him to depend on. And so this thing of religion, Paul is just kicking it literally in the teeth as we walk through this text in Colossians. So let's go back to verse nine. We'll walk through this together. Verse nine, for in him, that's Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. There's our Gnostic word. Paul loves to take the favorite words of Gnosticism, like wisdom and philosophy, and he loves to take this word. This word fullness is used eight times in the book of Colossians. It literally means fullness. Pleroma is the Greek word. It's the Gnostic word. And so the Gnostics taught that the reason this earth is so bad is because God created the angels and as the angels got further away from him, the worst angel of all known as the Demiurge created the earth and that is why the earth is so bad because he was indeed actually a wicked or evil angel and he created this horrible place. They felt like philosophically they needed an answer to the question, if God is so holy and so powerful and so good, then why is there so much stuff happening bad in this earth? Have you ever gotten that question before? And so the Gnostics said, we've got to figure out the answer to this question. And then they said, all matter is evil. So Jesus was not God in the flesh because it would be an abomination for God to become flesh because flesh is evil. And so they taught you had to work your way up through these angelic emanations. And so you'd pray through the rung of angels. You would pray up the ladder. Uh, some of you may not be old enough to remember this, but do you remember the toy? And it's really a, a, a dangerous toy that we grew up with, a slinky. Remember that? That thing would pinch the, the herd out of you, right? And if you don't know, just Google it, sl slinky. We didn't have Google, so we had a slinky, right? And so you would take this little wire construction that could pinch your little fingers and you'd put it on top of the stairs and it would go down by itself and you'd watch. And that was like so entertaining for us. And I look at the Gnostic way of going through the angelic realms. It's kind of like a slinky going up toward God. Folks, that's exactly what religion is. It's man's attempt to earn God's blessing and Christianity says, you're a Christian because you have earned God's blessing. You do what you do because he does love you. You're not trying to earn it. You have it. That's your identity. And that's why we do the good works that we do. So he says, all the fullness, he turns the word on them, all the fullness of deity dwelled in Jesus. He was not ever, not completely God, all at the same time, all at once. He was always God. He is the firstborn from death. He's the first one to die and rise again. And so when you look at this word, how do we approach God? Because you've got to understand who Jesus is. If Jesus is the fullness of God, we don't approach God. Please get this. We don't approach God through a priest. We don't approach God through a denomination. We don't approach God through a pastor. We don't approach God through a church program. The way we approach God is through Jesus, where the fullness of deity dwells. That word dwell there, I think in terms of, it literally means to permanently dwell. I think in terms of the difference, some of you may rent and some of you may own your home. If you rent your home, you can't go in there and just knock walls down if you don't like the walls. It's not your home, right? 
You have to get permission. You can't rip carpet up. You can't paint the walls new. But when you own your home and your wife says, because it always comes from them, right? Your wife says, I want to knock that wall down. You can knock it down. It's the fullness of deity owned, permanently dwelled in Jesus. Jesus operated in the fullness of the power of the triune God all the time. It permanently dwelled in him. When he was a man, he wasn't less God. He puts aside some of his powers, some of his attributes momentarily while he's in the flesh, but he's always still fully God and fully man in the flesh. And Paul says, I'll use the same word, the fullness of deity permanently dwelled in him. So the question this morning is, how will you get to heaven? And if you're trusting in anything else other than Jesus plus nothing, that boat, my friend, will not hold. Jesus, what Paul is saying is Jesus is the bridge that holds. It's the bridge that gets you to heaven. Can you improve upon Jesus? I think not. When Jesus was brought up at the baptism waters, God the Father said from heaven, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. There's never been a religious leader where God the Father said that about him. You know what? He's another way. He's another way. I kind of like her. So yeah, listen to her too. No, it's Jesus. The fullness of deity dwelled in this man. The boat holds. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or are in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That word reconcile, that's the key word in this text. Reconcile literally means to change back. It's to change someone back to what they were originally supposed to be. That you and I were one times at enmity with him, and now we're friends with him. That you and I were hostile toward him, and now we love him. And you didn't do that. You didn't cause that. It says he reconciles us. That that's, we're the object of the verb. He reconciles us. He changed us. He redeemed us. He forgave us. What part of salvation do you and I play? We got lost. That's our part. Ephesians 2, 1, you're dead in your trespasses. We talk about this all the time, that when you and I were born, we were born sinners. You don't have to teach your kids how to sin. They naturally know how to be selfish. You've got to teach them how to share because mom has sin, dad has sin, DNA, sinful baby. You get this child, they're dead in their trespasses. People love to bring babies to me because I'm supposed to kiss a lot of babies. So I kiss babies. And I'm looking at that baby, they're thinking, that, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm like, that's a big sinner is what it is. That's just a sinful baby, right? And you've got to train that child. In, now, they're cute, they're cute sinners, but you've got to train that child in the way they should go. And so the fullness of deity dwells in him, and Jesus reconciles all things back to himself. It says, look at it, whether on earth or in heaven. Now, when God created the earth, he said, it is good says it several times. It is good. It is good. It is good. Pre-Genesis 3, there was no cancer. Pre-Genesis 3, there was no sickness. Pre-Genesis 3, there was no blindness. Pre-Genesis 3, there was no tornadoes. There was no earthquakes. And then something happens in Genesis 3, and man says, you know what? I think God is holding out on us. I think there's more, and I want more. He's not enough. Religion. And so I'm going to eat of this fruit, and then I'm going to cover myself. I'm going to make fig leaves. I'm going to do the work, and I'm going to cover myself. First religion, Genesis 3. And from Genesis 3 to Revelation 21, we are in this fallen world. It's not right. That's why we have natural disasters that happen in this world. That's why I always say that just as many Christians get hit by drunk drivers as non-Christians get hit by drunk drivers. Just as many Christians have cancer as non-Christians have cancer. Because this world is not right. The animal kingdom, we're at enmity with the animal kingdom. There's only a small sliver of animals in the whole animal kingdom that you'll allow to live in your house and be around your kids. And there's these little dogs that sit in your laps when you drive or whatever. It's just a small sliver. Everything else, you don't have cobras in your living room, right? You don't have anacondas in your bathroom, right? Because we're at enmity. It's broken. It's messed up since Genesis 3. Romans 8 says... That creation has, has, been, has become futile. It, it's, become, um, it, it's become vanity. It's death. We live on a dying orb right now. 
And what Jesus is said of here, whether on earth or in heaven, he's going to reconcile it back. The Bible says like this, that one day Jesus will come back and that the, the earth will be burned up with the elements of heat and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That it will be as it was meant to be. It's not the way it is now, but it will be the way it's going to be. And that he will reconcile not just people, but he will actually re reconcile the entire creation as well. It's interesting when Jesus rides in uh, before the week that he's, he's uh, crucified, he rides into the town on the foal of a donkey. It's a picture of the animal kingdom submitting to Jesus. When Jesus was about to go to the cross, what did they put on his head? A crown of what? Thorns. It's a picture. Genesis 3 Man is now cursed, and by the sweat of your brow you will till the land, and it will produce thorns. It is a sign of the curse. And so Paul is saying here that not only is God going to reconcile people, but he's also going to reconcile all of creation. At Jesus' temptation, he's out in the wilderness with the wild beasts. This person who died and rose and ascended will bring back all things as it should be. Now, if you can find another Savior who died for you, was God in the flesh, and rose from the dead and can reconcile the entire world, including creation, back, you may want to follow that world leader. But I have only found one that the Father said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. As for now, Paul says that creation moans, it groans. It's like the pangs of childbirth. By the way, women, pain in childbirth, that's another result of the fall. You can go to Genesis 3, that's why that hurts, Right? Because literally in the Bible, you are bringing forth another sinner. And God says, you're going to have pain doing that because you're bringing mo forth more sin into the world. Before that, for Genesis 3, I think women could have babies, no problems. Like drinking a Coke, eating an Oreo. Oh, look, there's my daughter. It was not a problem at all. <laughs> and we got to come with these epidurals and all this stuff. Why? Because this world is messed up. The Bible says it like this, the lion will lay down with a lamb. That the child will play in the snake's den. I mean, do your best to recycle, but we're not going to change this earth, right? That's going to be Jesus reconcile all things back to himself. The Bible says that one day he will take the wicked, fallen, angelic realm, and he will throw them into a place called the lake of fire. And that every knee will bow on that day and every tongue will confess, your Lord. It will say what Paul says in Colossians 2,000 years ago, that all the deity, all the fullness of God dwelled in this man. There will not be at that point anybody saying, but what about my religion? What about my beliefs? What about all these things I've done? All of that stuff falls aside when the Son of God is sitting on the right hand of the Father and the entire planet is bowing down to him, confessing, you are Lord. Another way of saying that is this, we win in the end. You can read the end of the book, we win. And so here's the goal, that you would confess Jesus Lord now and not when you're made to. That you do it now and not when you have to because you're going to do it one way or the other. Life goes easier when you submit to God instead of bowing up against God. You follow me? And so Paul is saying, this is the guy. The fullness of deity dwells in this man, no one else. You with me? Verse 21, let's see what else he says. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Now, verse 21, so last week we gave you, and I gave this fancy word, Christology. That's the doctrine of Christ. That one verse, verse 21, you're alienated, you're hostile in mind, you do evil deeds. That one verse right there gives you three more theologies. It gives you hermardiology, the doctrine of sin. It says that you and I were hostile toward God. It's not that we're pretty good guys, we're pretty good gals. No, the Bible says that you and I were at enmity with him. Now that's hard for some of us, especially if you grew up in church thinking, well, there were times in my life I didn't follow God. There were times in my life I might not have fully submitted to him, but I was never like hostile. That's not the word I would use. Well, see, here's the deal. If you're not all in, then you're all against Biblically speaking, you're following Jesus or you're against me. Either follow me or be against me, but lukewarm, he says, I'll spit out of my mouth, right? And so there's an understanding biblically that you can't kind of cut and paste the parts of Jesus that kind of fit the lifestyle. It's either he's Lord 
or he's lunatic or a liar, as we said last week. So you, you see here the hermodiology. You also see soteriology here. It's the doctrine of salvation. Look at it again. You were alienated. You were hostile. You were doing evil deeds. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation says this, that you were not just away from God. You were hopeless. You were helpless. And you were dead. Dead people can't make decisions to follow Jesus. Dead people can't get baptized. Dead people can't be religious. Dead people can't do the things necessary to be in heaven. It's got to be done unto you. You're the receiver of rec reconciliation. So understanding our hermardiology, our Christology, our soteriology, and also the anthropology. That's the doctrine of man, that you and I were alienated. You ever looked at your kids and said, you were an alien, right? Alienated. The Bible says that you and I were at enmity. We were not children of the king. We were lost. We were done. Now, how do you know if that's true of you? Because for all of us, there were years where we were not following the Lord. And he was pursuing and he was presenting and he was getting after you. And you're like, nope, I want to do it my way. And then one day he had to do what he did to Paul, knock him off his donkey and blind him for three days. He had to do something enough in my life and in your life for you to finally say, I give. I get it. You're it. Maybe you saw a real Christian and you thought, that's different than what I have. And so God has to do this unto us. And so we were alienated. We were, we would say in Christian terms, we were lost. We were unimprovable. We were foreign to God. So how do I know that we don't get this concept? You ever had this thought? Well, I think those people are definitely Christians. I think those people would never believe in Christ, right? The fact that you believed in Christ means that anybody can believe in Christ. You remember O.J. Simpson? <laughs> you remember O.J. Simpson? So O.J. Simpson, see, this is what the, this is what the world does. O.J. Simpson had an advocate. His name was Johnny Cochran. Remember Johnny Cochran? the best lawyer money can buy. And Johnny Cochran's job with O.J. Simpson was to say, I know it looks like he's guilty. I know you've got all the evidence to show that he's guilty, but he's really a good guy, right? Jesus is our advocate, much better than Johnny Cochran. Jesus says the opposite. Jesus says, no, he's guilty. <laughs> he's much more guilty than you realize, but he just looks like a good guy. That's exactly what the Bible says of you and I that we may have been going to church, we may have been singing the hymns, we may have been giving money and serving, but our hearts were still all about us. And when we did the good things we did, it's not that it didn't help people, it's not that it didn't make an impact, it's that we did it for our own glory, for our own feel good about ourselves. So someone pats us on the back and say, you're a marvelous person, and you just kind of soak that in. Why? Because I'm sitting on the throne of my life. And then all of a sudden, one day, God kicks him off the throne. I realize it's his throne, and I move to the side, and he takes over. And so now when I do those things, I do it because I want him to get the glory. We were physically, spiritually, emotionally dead. And that's true of anybody that's ever been born in the history of mankind. Mother Teresa, outside of Christ, dead. Doesn't matter she's a missionary, dead. God has to change her from the inside out. Have I butchered verse 21 enough for you? I mean, you got to get this. If you don't get this, every other doctrine and theology in your, in your understanding of God is going to fall apart. I'm lost. That's the first thing you got to understand. I am dead in my trespasses. There is nothing I can do to earn God's favor and to be loved. God must do something to me. And then one day God comes and he brings your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh and he ignites you. And now you have understanding you didn't have before. And then you place your faith in him. That faith is not your part even. It's God giving you the ability to have faith because dead people don't have faith. The, the, the faith is even a gift from God itself. And then he gives you that faith. He regenerates your heart. And then you start to see him for who he really is. You fall at his feet and say, you're the Lord. I'm not. I want you to take charge because I don't make a good deity. You're the boss. And God does that to us. Let's look at the next verse, verse 22. He has now reconciled, there's our word, changed back, in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That is a verse that we need to put in our refrigerators. 
I could never serve in the church because you don't know what I've done in my past. You are holy and blameless. If you knew about me what I know about me, you would never let me even come to church. You are holy and blameless. I could never be in a small group. You are holy and blameless. There's no way I could serve and lead. You are holy and blameless. See, we still have the religious mentality when we try to add up the score and we determine if we're worthy enough to do something God tells us to do. You are holy and blameless. The way God looks at you right now is the way he looks at his son, and his son is holy and blameless. But you don't know what I did yesterday. You being holy and blameless has nothing to do with what you've done or haven't done. It's what Jesus did. So when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. That's amazing. Holy and blameless. Hypothetically, you should be able to look at a Christian and be persuaded that Jesus is the only hope for humanity. In a Christian, you see the future reconciliation of all things as it's gonna be. If you were the devil, what would you attack? The Christians. If I can just cut that message off to the world, if I can just get them, like I said last week, discouraged, if I can discredit their testimony, if I can get them depressed, if I can get them down, then they'll stop talking, they'll stop living, they'll stop representing who Jesus is. And we can just shut the voice off. Reconciliation is an act accomplished by God. He died the death that I deserve to die. He lived the life that I could never live. He gained the victory that I could never gain. He has the security of salvation that I can never maintain. And look what Paul says. He says he did it in his body of flesh. Now, the Gnostics said what about the flesh? It's what? Evil. And so Paul says, he did it. He reconciled you in his body of flesh. He did it through the very thing that you're calling evil. And he says, he reconciled me in his fleshly body by his death. Something you got to understand here is that the teachings of Jesus don't reconcile you. You can think Jesus is a marvelous man. You can love the feeding of the 5,000 story. You can love the prodigal son story. You can believe that he was even a divine man. And you can follow his teachings. You can attend church. You can do all the things that you think means following his teachings. None of that will ever reconcile you. Trusting in the crucified and risen death of Jesus Christ is what saves. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For it's by grace we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Why? Lest any man should boast. Religious people love to boast. So I believe that America is chock full. Churches are packed with people who would say, I think Jesus is a great man. I believe he was God. I believe in his teachings. I try to practice his teachings. But they may not be believers because they're still trying to reconcile themselves through their religiousness, through keeping and holding to the teachings. That's what Jehovah's Witness does. That's what Mormons do. That's what is Islamic people do. That's what Hindus do. That's what Buddhists do. Christianity is different. We're not following a set of teachings. We're following a person. And as we follow the person, our heart longs to hold to the teachings. Why? Because it makes life more like his. His DNA gets into us and we start looking more like Jesus. How do you know if you're a Christian or not? Do you look more like Jesus now than you did five years ago? Are you growing in your faith? I believe it's possible to attend church your entire life and never have a heart that beats for the Lord. And I believe you can love the music and I believe you can give and do all these things. And your heart is never warmed to the things of God. Your heart never bleeds for people to come to Christ. You never think about folks in other nations who are lost and dying without a Savior. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Only at Calvary is our salvation. So why did he have to die? You ever been asked that? Why did Jesus have to die? Why could he just come and say, I'm the Lord. Everybody start worshiping me. Why did he have to die? In order to present you, Paul says here, holy and blameless. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Adam and Eve's first thought after they sinned was to run from God, to hide, to cast blame, right? Woman, what did you do? The serpent. 
<laughs> right? Man, what did you do? The woman you gave me, right? So cast blame. I'm the victim. I'm going to run and I'm going to hide. That's what sin does. And their first instinct was to become religious. Let's cover ourselves with fig leaves. Let's create a system where we can present ourselves again to God, right? And so God comes and what does he do? He says, drop the dumb fig leaves. I still see you. You're still naked. And I'm going to take an animal. I'm going to kill this animal. I'm going to take the hide, the skin of this animal, and I'm going to make clothing or garments fit for you. Something's got to die because you sinned. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Why did Jesus have to die? Because I'm a sinner. That's why Jesus had to die. I couldn't earn my way. God is holy. The only way I'm ever going to stand in front of him is I've got to have an advocate that's worthy of God the Father. The fullness of deity dwells in who? Jesus. Who's your advocate? Jesus. How can I go to heaven? Jesus. So when you get there, again, I'm, I'm going I'm to say this till I die. You don't hope the good outweighs the bad. You're not going to get there with your mama who's a Baptist. Well, she's a great Baptist, so I should be in. I'm, I'm grafted in, right? No. You get in because of the work of Jesus and trusting in that work. And no one else is going to be standing there except you. I'll be standing there. You'll be standing there. And Jesus is our advocate if you trust in him. And you will be blameless. Who does the presenting? Jesus. I'm spotless because of his work. I'm declared righteous. I don't become righteous. I'm declared righteous. So if someone says, well, I'd like to come to church, but I got to clean my life up first. You ever heard that? No, no, no. You come to church and God will clean your life up, right? You can't clean it up. You'll, you'll never be good enough in your mind, religious enough to come to church. Do you think you're innocent? I would love to meet the spouse of someone who would say, I've never sinned. Because the Bible says this, that Satan stands before the throne of God day and night accusing us. Satan knows we're not innocent. Look what he's doing now. Look what she's thinking now. Did you see that attitude? Did you see her roll her eyes back at that person? Did you see how she's driving? Did you see her just, what? She, the Bible says that Satan accuses us before the throne day and night. And Jesus, our advocate says, it's covered. It's covered. Me. You see him? Look at me. What's true of me? True of them. I know they're boneheads. I know they're lug nuts. Look at me. Blameless. Otherwise, we will never stand before God the Father. We will die because that's what happens when unholiness comes before holiness. But Christianity has extreme honesty. We'll be presented completely as we are, and the Holy Lamb of God will stand on our behalf. So, either all made man-made religions are right and Christianity is wrong, or Christianity is right and all the other religions are wrong because they're all separated. Either Jesus had the fullness of deity dwelling in him, or he was just another good man, and he was a little delusional. Maybe he had dementia, and he just didn't understand, so he said he was God. But when you start walking on water, you may want to take some notes. When you turn water into wine, you may want to listen. And when you can start feeding 5,000 from a lunchbox, you may want to pay attention. But when a man gets in the grave, and they roll a stone in front of it, and then three days later the stone is removed, the body's gone, you may think someone stole it, but then when he shows up to 500 people, eyewitnesses, you may want to give your life to follow that man. Verse 23, we'll close with this verse. If indeed you continue in the faith. Now that word if doesn't mean doubt. Our, our salvation is secure, but I'm going to explain what this means. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope. The, the, the town of Colossae lived on a, it was on a fault line where they had volcanic eruptions. They had earthquake eruptions in this town. And oftentimes this little town would shake. And I love what Paul says there. Look at it again with the understanding of where these guys are living. He says, if you continue to face stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope. What does it mean to know that you're secure in your faith? It means you're a Christian. How can you tell? Number one, you're orthodox. You believe that Jesus was God in the flesh and you put your faith and trust in him, you're orthodox. Number two, your life mimics the Father. It doesn't mean you're always perfect. It doesn't mean you don't mess up. But sin bothers you. 
It means there's this divine standard that you find yourself always trying to live up to and you struggle to be more holy because you want glory and honor to come to him. You fail, you ask for forgiveness, you try harder the next day. You're not trying to earn the salvation, you're struggling. You're striving, as Paul says, because you want honor and glory to come to him and because he has saved you. Paul says it like this, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You fight the fight. It's a fight every day. Some days I feel like I lose it. Some days I feel like I, I gain ground, but the work has already been done by him. I'm striving to be more like him. I want his DNA to be in me. So hypothetically speaking, someone should be able to come to Dripping Springs campus and say, hey, in a world of hate, these people are different. In a world full of racism and bigotry, these people are different. In a world where it depends on how much money you have, depends on where you sit at the table, these people are different. Hypothetically, the world should look at a Christian and know that Jesus had the fullness of God dwelling inside of him. And we are those people. We are the first fruits. So Paul closes, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Perseverance is the hallmark of the true saint. How do you know if someone's a believer? Wait and see. Wait and see. You come up to me in the, in the back here this morning and say, I want you to know I'm a believer. I'm like, great. Well, do you believe me? Well, wait and see. Because something's going to happen in your life, and we'll see if your hope is in the Lord. We'll see. I can't tell you how many times I see people every year punt their faith because something happens that they think is unfair in their life. This world is broken. Welcome to the rest of your life. It's going to be unfair. That's why we, we don't rescue our kids when they go through a hard time. We let them sit in a little bit because they got to get ready for the rest of their life, right? Because the rest of their life's not going to tell them, you can do anything you want to do. That's one of the biggest lies parents have ever told their kids. You can't be anything you want to be. It doesn't matter how bad I want to be a sinner for the Los Angeles Lakers. I'll never be that. It doesn't matter. I can't be certain things. So you let them fall. You let them pick with their beak outside of their own egg. You don't break the egg for them because this world is jacked up. But one day, right, he's going to reconcile it. So I want to close with a few verses. This is the task from this text. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is what this text that I just talked to you today means. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen? Someone ever meet you 20 years after they knew you? And you become a Christian since then, you're like, wow, you've changed. You, you remember the things? Oh, yeah, I remember. What happened? Jesus, new creature. If anything, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's, it's interesting. The enemy, the devil, loves to remind us of our past problems and our past hangups and failures, doesn't he? He always wants to talk about the past. Jesus always talks about the future. Your presence determined on the faith of a future promise yet to come. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ, there's our word, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, wait a minute. Not only did he reconcile me, but now he's giving me a task. I've got the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, praise the Lord, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. He says it again, entrusting to us. We're the us there. You and I have a job now. Why do I baptize people and not hold them under and send them to glory? Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> Every time I baptize people, I tell them, hey, I will pull you up. I promise you. Now, if they're bigger guys, because we have this little tub thing, I'll say, I need you to do a crunch when I pull you down because I need some help. But I don't hold them under. I pull them up. Why? Because we have the ministry of reconciliation. Now, we've been reconciled, and that's our job description now. Verse 20, therefore... We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God makes his presentation of who he is through his church, through his Christians, through his followers. Verse 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What's your job when you leave here today? to represent 
represent, to represent Jesus to a world that doesn't know him. Your job is to be Jesus in that office. Your job is to be the scriptures alive in your family. And so they'll see you, they'll go, whoa, that's different. And then what they're doing is they're going to wait and watch you go through something tough because they think, well, her, her life's perfect. Of course she's happy. And then something's going to happen. And they're going to watch you. And when you go through that holding to the sure hope found only in Jesus and you're rock solid, you're an anchor, they'll go, that person's legit. That person believes and says and does all the same thing. It matches. That's what we call integrity, oneness. What I say and what I do is the same thing. We're non-hypocritical, right? We are people of integrity. Church, does this make sense? So let me pray for you as we pray for this ministry that you and I have the rest of this week. Father, as we, as, as myself, as my friends here at the Ridge, as we go out into our communities this week, we've got a ministry, we've got a job description. And it's the ministry of reconciliation. You changed us and you want to use us now to represent you so you can change others. We don't have to save them. We can't save them. We don't have to persuade them. We can't persuade them. We don't have to make them come to life. We just need to represent you well. And Father, you do all the work. Father, I pray that this week, someone in Austin, Texas would run up against someone that calls Austin Ridge home. And their life would change because of that encounter, because they're really encountering you. And Lord, I want to thank you for making us blameless. We don't deserve it. We ran, we were alienated, we were hostile, and you broke our hearts wide open to the truth of your gospel. We are so grateful. We give because we're grateful. We serve because we're grateful. We pray because we're grateful. We read our Bibles because we're grateful. We're not trying to earn anything. We do it because it's been given to us. Lord, thank you that this is not about religion. This is about following Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.